Welcome to Mentor Time, everybody. Today, we're going to talk about are you accidentally giving away your power, what I'm calling your power in the convo, in the conversations. Here's what we're going to cover today. Communications and power. Why does this still exist? And we always end with what should you do? Here's my takeaway. I want you to think about this as putting yourself first to take back your, your power. And that will make sense as we go along. But accidentally giving away your power has a lot to do with how we present the information. Let's talk about communications and power. I'd like to do a brief Slido poll I always make them anonymous so that you can write what you want. And I would welcome hearing from you what situations or situation is when you feel empowered in a conversation. I want you to tell me when you might feel powerful, that you're not just sitting there and wondering if, if they're going to give you a chance to talk or whatever. And I will go ahead and open my phone and also do it. I know it'll take a little bit of time for us to write this. It's an open word choice. It's anonymous. No one's going to know what you wrote. Talking about subjects where I think I'm considered an expert by my peers. Great. That's a great one. When I'm prepared with info that I think people, that people want to hear about. Mentor time, I feel free, maybe not powerful. Thank you. Just take another minute. We have someone else typing. This is totally anonymous, but I want to know what makes you feel empowered. When I feel ready and I know what is will be discussed. I love that. When I have time to prepare. Okay, so we're hearing preparedness and readiness. We're hearing wanting to know in advance about the topic or whatever is supposed to go on. And some people feel like at least in mentor time, they feel free. I love the idea that you feel free. Here's some issues I hear. And I wrote this about myself deliberately. I'm sure people say, I wish Sue would stop talking. I have a lot to say. Or my colleague tells me I take over the combos, but I actually don't. I suddenly get nervous when I talk to my manager. And these are normal, and some are things you can control and some aren't. I'm briefly going to go over a table that I used, I made to summarize a lot of dense information. There's a lot on the screen. <clears throat> these are two psychologists who identified seven types of power that impact, they're calling it workplace power dynamics. And actual, actually, they inhabit everything we do, not inhabit. I'm going to go down the left-hand side. Coercive power is just what it says. Threatening punishment. So if you ever had a manager who you know could give you a bad performance review or even says that, you're right on the edge of getting a letter to your file. That's coercive power. Expert power is when someone knows everything and you don't know much and you're in a, often a learning situation. In this case, a bilingual employee who has is maybe not as comfortable in a second language. But the expert power is when it's not just the person thinks they're so wonderful, but they are per perceived as bringing an expertise and everybody acknowledges that. It can be from reward if you're given incentives for, think about introverts and extroverts. If you're getting, given giving incentives as a manager, giving incentives to reward people speaking in, out in meetings, introverts don't like to do that. And that kind of reward is not going to help them get over there. It's not that they have a fear of speaking sometimes, they just don't always want to contribute. Informational power is similar to, in my view, expert power, and that is where there's someone in an area that they are the expert in. Everybody acknowledges that. they. It says here they have a niche, and the company values them, and sometimes they get 
glorification because of that. That's my informal view. Formal power is the power dynamics that we go through when the CEO is on charge of in charge of a management team, like I used to be on the second level, the management team, not the C-suite. When your supervisor is in charge of you, when it's formally acknowledged, it's written down and codified in many ways. Referent power might be considered similar to the informal networks and informal culture at companies like here it is formally if you want something done in to get your air conditioning turned more comfortable don't go to the building manager go to so and so who has the temperature control and she doesn't mind adjusting it that's what referent power is but it also can be negative in the sense of this person then becomes an informal leader for example and finally, connection power is people who can help you. And this is why I don't like to call it workplace power dynamics, because it often goes beyond the workplace in terms of direct colleagues. But where you need help to get goals met, these are people you perceive or want to be able to connect with because they can help you out. But it's also hard to ask them for these things. I found an interesting paper from South Africa that I wanted to share the four influences because we work in global settings, all of us, because we're all interested in the global world. I thought it was important to look at these things because they take culture and other areas power as much broader than what I just gave you examples of in the table. So the first, they call this the power distance, so status and hierarchy. And they're not saying that one is better than the other. They're saying some cultures value less hierarchy. Other cultures want more distance. One of the reasons that I don't talk about personal branding, I talk about professional branding, is that in many countries and in many regions, most of us are still very conscious of some formalities about who's in charge of things, how people are referred to. It's not the U.S. casual jeans look where you can call Mark Zuckerberg Mark. Maybe you call him Mr. Zuckerberg. There's much less of that power distance. You'll see this continuum one side and another. So it's not one or the other. It's just being aware of where the mismatch might be for a conversation that you're in. I thought this was interesting. They're calling it orientations to identity. And an individualist has the expectation in their company or in some group that individuals will, will be recognized. And a collectivist would be, our team did that. And that's where there's shared credit. That's where there's acknowledgement and there's no one person being singled out. Think about the orchestra. You may have the individualist may be the first chair violin, and then the rest of the violins are all told, you're all great if it goes well. All right, number three is orientation to rules. This definitely has comes along with um, certain geographic regions. Particularist values re relationships over rules, and the universalist looks tends towards more rules. So I would say growing up in the Northeast of Northeast East Coast of America, of the US, I grew up in something that was in a culture that was very rules focused and in many ways still is. Our culture is shifting a lot because we have a lot more diversity in people who are able to show us that sometimes it doesn't matter. Like today was a deadline for some course cohort people and I say to them, it's due at 10 a.m., but if you can't meet the deadline, send it when you can, and I'll figure it out. This is one that I grew up being a rule follower, and so now I'm trying to walk the middle of the line in this number three. And the last one, they call polychronic and monochronic. It's using a lot of Latin and Greek in these terms. And this is time and process. Polychronic values relationships. Monochronic says, you're on the schedule. Now, I freely admit that I am going to be early. 
I don't like it when my sister's late. I don't like it when we have to tell her dinners an hour before we're actually serving it because otherwise she won't arrive on time. But we've learned to adjust. And other cultural values in the world that we do work in globally, we recognize that. So this again is something that even though the I think they could have chosen different terms that are a little more friendly. I thought these four ways of thinking about power felt to me a little, had more flexibility acknowledging both sides of the convo than, than the list of all seven characteristics I read. Why does this still exist? Here's my general comment. Maybe true, maybe not, but this is my view of it seven decades in. Although I'm not going to focus on women versus men communication forms, there's a lot of these examples where it's we've, we're habituated into a certain conversation style. And I think we're finally realizing, and you'll see my advice for you in the third section, that you can be assertive in the best sense of the word without being aggressive. We just need more people on the other side of the conversation to understand that it's okay to be assertive. And I'll show you some examples. So for each of these, I'm gonna give you the statement of what usually happens and then give you, so you'll see that in uh, dark pink on the left and then green is a rephrasing of it. So I'm going a little bit already into what can we do. But the first one I had written down a couple months, weeks ago, when I thought about this topic in detail, I thought, oh, it's because we waffle in speaking. And that led me to, I'm really working hard to not use slang or not use idioms that may not be understood globally. So I went and looked at waffled as a definition. And it's not exactly Merriam-Webster as a dictionary. And they say it's avoid giving a definite answer or position. When I talk about waffling in speaking and what I grew up to understand it to be, it is more not that you don't have an answer, but you give, it could be this, or be, you're being very careful not to be very definite. So I looked up another phrase, because when I did synonyms, all the synonyms didn't really lead to anything. But I also grew up with hemming and hawing. I'd never looked up why we say it. But people hem and haw, like saying, that's not the hemming and hawing. Again, for me, hemming and hawing means you don't want to give a definite answer. You ask someone who, are you coming to my party? And maybe they want to come and they're not sure, or maybe they don't want to come, but they don't want to tell you that to your face. I just, this is my little preliminary grammar lesson. I went back to waffle. My advice is I'm seeing waffling. Don't waffle, be definitive. Normally waffling would be, I think I could lead this or I might be able to add some value in this discussion. Be definitive. I know I blah, blah, blah. I can do this in the next 24 hours. I am ready to take on this, or I'm ready with the notes already prepared. Second example, put I before anyone else. Now, I know there's no eyes in anyone, but I want you to think about how you lead with yourself. Instead of saying, as part of a team, comma, I blah, 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 or the team did, or in our department, comma, we, you're going to phrase it. And this phrasing is actually clearer English. When we talk, I talked a few weeks ago about CDC and they're plain English, writing in plain English, English rules. But you will get statements like, I was X. I was the project coordinator in a four-person team. You're stating right up front what your role is, but you're not ignoring the team because people say, Sue, our work, we all do our work in as a team, and I don't do this by myself. You can give people credit, but you can give them credit after you talk about you. Keep your power. 
Again, a grammar lesson. This is a full dependent clause because it starts, it doesn't start with the noun. It doesn't start with the subject. It's when she was a project coordinator, comma, the project went very well. Dependent clauses cause people to pause because usually it is additional information that isn't critical. And you want to capture people's interest. So instead, you would just say, she was the project coordinator in a four-person team, and then they did blah, or then they succeeded, whatever. It's rephrasing and reframing. Over the weekend, I get a daily message from an evaluation group, and this was the Saturday um, that ca it came from a team. This person, Kiani Ora, wrote about how she's always acknowledged that she grew up bilingual in English and a couple other languages, trilingual. But she said, I lived in a certain part of this city where everybody was from the country in the area I'm from. I had all these lived experiences. And yet as an evaluator, I'm supposed to put aside our biases as much as we can. Her point is, when we do that, we try to be as careful as we can as evaluators. But actually, she discovered in something she recently did, and I think many of us can see this in different ways in our experiences, when you have lived experiences, you bring some extra value. In her case, she could help the team and the people being interviewed understand the focus she knew how to dig deeper in a culturally appropriate way, in a culturally cultural communications appropriately way. And that helped her. She's native Spanish speaker also. I have not heard about lived experiences, the power dynamic of that until this brought it to my mind. I thought it was a really useful point as we acknowledge in so many ways what people bring to their work. So what should you do? I put a hand up deliberately because I want you to tell everybody else to stop while you put yourself back in power by putting yourself per first. All right, I'm, this is going to sound a little not Sue, but I want you to show your physical power. And by that, the power poses this woman's doing it. Hands on hips. I don't think you can see it in my Zoom box here. Standing up with your feet apart or your feet close together. But it's claiming your space physically. As we sit down in meetings, whether they're in-person meetings or in Zoom, Take a second or two to conjure this pose and give yourself that feeling. Similarly to the advice to smile, because when you smile, it makes you more engaged. I think I told some of you that I now present using a standing desk, and I know that it makes me feel more engaged and hopefully lively on your observing part, listening part. Capture attention. And that is by reframing the, when I did this, when the team did this, instead of starting with that, start with the outcome. We achieved more than 30% interview return by the team, by my leading the team to do whatever. So reframing your statements again to show how you contribute to a larger goal. Ron and I have been talking about this in various ways for several months on, the, on these mentor time sessions. I want you to claim your place. So again, lead with your work before anyone else's. You can definitely acknowledge the team's efforts, but your work and what part of it is what you want to have people hear. Similarly, use your results when you can. And I've said this, and there's at least one mentor time on this. It's not bragging. It's a fact. When you use your evidence-based results, it's a fact. This was advice from the article where I got the seven characteristics of power dynamics. So I'm not going to present everything that they talked about. The most powerful one I thought was when they say, name the power dynamic. Not that you can say to someone, oh, you're using uh, coercive power on me. But in many cases, it's hierarchies. 
cultural hierarchies or actual hierarchies if it's a boss subordinate relationship. When you challenge these respectfully, there are several ways you can do it. I'm going to give you two that I think are very commonly, will be commonly helpful. When you disagree on something and you have a way to define the relationship, you can say something like this. I know that I report to you, or I know that I am a team member of our four. And then you respectfully say, and my view is different. I see the whatever is how you give it in an appropriate way by acknowledging where the power dynamic is, but you acknowledge it. So you're saying, I know I'm a team member and, and not but. Don't fall into the butt trap. My view is different. Another power dynamic solution is to use, I was thrilled with this, evidence. Bring your data. Have data-related discussions. So when you go to your boss and you want more money, I want to discuss, you'd say what you want to discuss. I want to discuss a higher merit raise based on Here's this data for the position, promotion, whatever it is, in this geographic area or in this company, so that you can claim attention. You can use the power dynamic by restating it appropriately, but also you can challenge the hierarchies. And then the final one is, Remember that you can always take control of the conversation, even if it doesn't feel like it's yours. And my feeling is you can choose to engage and how on your terms. You can redirect it by saying something like, that's important. Now I need advice to whatever, or I'd help to understand what you meant by. And if you're getting into a situation where this person's asking you a lot of questions, remember that you can also, unless you're in, in, in an interview and there's even ways to skirt around things in interviews, you don't have to answer the question exactly, generally. You can figure out how you want to redirect it and get the engagement focused on. Usually when people are questioning, they're getting more at what your role was or what you might be responsible for or why something happened, you can get that subjectivity out of there by redirecting the conversation towards how do you work towards the problem resolution. Tips are all about you taking control of the convo, putting yourself first in an appropriate way, but to describe your role, to reframe how and in what way you contribute, so that you aren't accidentally giving away your power because we choose have been sometimes raised to say, I'm only part of a team. That's what I hear a lot. I have a few references and I'll send out the um, tables uh, separately for you if you wanna take a look at them as well. And I'll ask Ron for comments. Yeah, that's interesting. Thank you, Sue. It was a good presentation of it. And it reminded me of some of your examples of structures and so on, power dynamics and so on. Many of, some of you will recognize that I was in the military. And of course, if you want to talk about structure and power dynamic, it's built on that. Uh, although it's interesting how in branches of the, of the military, it's different. And there are some branches are much more direct, but there's some interesting things that brings up. And I think it happens in, in the uh, workplace outside of the military. And it has to do with what I'm going to call fraternizing. And so you have, have situations where on one hand, you're in a, in a workplace and, uh, and the like, but sometimes there's a dynamic that gets created because of personal relationships that develop while you're in the 
workplace. And so that's been interesting. And it, and it goes back to some of your charts. You end up having other power dynamics start to get happen because of these informal relationships that might happen as well. And that's where, in fact, maybe you say, look, if you want to know who the real power is behind whatever and how the decisions really happen, go see Solis because that's the person who has the most influence, even though the, you know, because the boss doesn't really know whatever. And you get that kind of a scenario that can happen. And, and, and it's curious, but when the boss is weak, <laughs> I guess is what I'm saying, this is not an uncommon thing. And so uh, it's interesting. And that becomes even more uh, curious when you're in one of these high power dynamic situations where the boss has a lot of authority and tends to wield it, but is doing it from a position of weakness. So you're stuck with these kinds of bizarre scenarios, but where you may in fact have a, a bully for a boss because they're in a weak position and yet they have the authority or something. These kinds of scenarios can add complexity to the essence of, this, of the scenarios you painted, I think. Another thing that I, I like the idea of help me understand. When you're dealing with, a, it sounds like it's a conflict situation you're dealing with there and where your boss is presenting a particular view and you're not all that keen on it and you have a better knowledge or you got a, you're closer to the situation or whatever, and you're concerned that approach is gonna actually make the situation worse. I've had personal experience with that where I was unable to veto the boss <laughs> and it made a mess of it. And so, you, so these kinds of things can happen. So the, the position that I had presented, <laughs> it, it really mattered and it didn't matter. That, that that I presented that view. So anyhow, so you, you can get into those kinds of things. I think it's really interesting. One last point is the idea of you take control of the conversation, but you also have the responsibility. And 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 it's the it's a curious one because you say somebody finds themselves. In fact, we just had a, an Olympics example for Canada, where the head coach or the the, the head coach for the soccer women's soccer team finally had to withdraw because of a scandal that occurred. And so as the leader, okay, yeah, you're the one supposed to be making it work, but things got out of control. You didn't understand it. You've got to take the responsibility for that as well. And that's an extreme case. But in the environment where you are stating your own position, because yeah, I did this, I contributed, I did, and keeping very clear that your involvement in the result, and then taking responsibility as well. And that's a good thing because it shows, it shows strength, shows character most of the time. And, and unless you're in a punitive environment where you, nobody makes mistakes, they just hide them. And the, these are abnormal environment. And, and it's interesting because uh, some of the uh, mentoring I have done, I have found that the uh, individuals I was working with found themselves in these bizarre, uh, abnormal, normal environments where it's uh it's a very it's a minefield for some individuals to try and navigate some of those things but anyway thanks very much sue that was that was great thank you for those remarks and thanks for the comment about responsibility yes you're right we do in taking this on we are also learning the role and the appropriate way to be responsible that the conversation gets directed in a positive move forward and not the, you said, whatever you blame. Yeah. Other comments? Anybody else have something they want to share or ask? Um, I, these, the last couple weeks of talking about biases in this topic, I didn't realize till yesterday, I was thinking, oh, we put these really close together. It's not going to always be that way next time we're talking about references for jobs or fellowships. But it's good for us to be aware of them. So anybody want to share or ask a question? Listening, I there was a lot of things that really rang true as like uh, as things that I need to work on, especially the whatever you want to call it, the hemming and the hawing or the or whatnot. Just I know that a lot of times I'm not direct enough in my answers and thinking specifically about interviews. And listening to some playback after some interviews, if I record it on my phone, and yeah, I can I can hear it, and I'm not direct enough, and so I, that's something I need to work on. And I really liked what you were saying about the when you phrase the answer instead of saying the team did, start with 
I was this part of the team and I did this rather than to to make sure that it, it reflects what you did in your work rather than just saying this happened and I may or may not have done something that was helpful for it. So that's I, great. I, I really like this as a topic and I think a lot about things from past jobs about, okay, yeah, I really could have had, I really could have spoken better and been, and been a little more assertive on things like that. So, yeah. Thank you for sharing that. And I just want to remind you all what Peter just said is the result of some cultural influences. I believe you're taught, we are taught to be less direct, even though in two different jobs as a VP, I was given books about fierce conversations and talking straightforward. You all have been acculturated, maybe not as much as I am. Academia, there's certain ways, there's certainly the hierarchy, but you're rewarded for not speaking directly. So you can imagine me with my pretty frank mouth in a group of researchers who are mostly introverts they could, I don't know if they knew what to do with me, but I appreciate you saying that. And that's why I wanted to give you all a chance to hear this because I realize how much we give away. Anyone else? Steve, how much of it do you think is generational? Because I feel like that coming through graduate school and into the workforce, that it was you were taught it was always we because you're part of a team and everything had to be shifted from I to we. Have you found that in your work that some of it is generational? I would like to say yes, but no. The okay. newer generation that are uh, the folks that are in the course, especially still have this, but Sue, I'm only part of a team. Part of that's learning how to acknowledge your contribution and feeling comfortable in your expertise as the most junior member, for example. But I think that there's still a way that people think is the appropriate way to, or they, they that's what they hear. I don't know, Stephanie, that it, I think the generation the generational problem may be the leaders in my generation that are still in charge, the old men, the old women, maybe even. You all know I'm pretty old. And those folks are still out there leading. I just went to something today and what? You're still at USAID? <laughs> you haven't retired yet? So I don't think it's generational. I find that the things that help all of you is when I remind you all that you have evidence, when it's facts that you're just stating your facts. You can take ownership of it. It's all those seven characteristics I wanted to go over just so you understood. Some of them you can't prevent and some are harder than others to reframe language around. I don't. I know in my lifetime, I will not see as much adjustment in culturally relevant ways of communications because some orgs even have a way that they want everybody to talk like them. That's enough on that. But I welcome hearing from the younger folks on there. Ron, you have a comment and then others yeah, that want to jump in. Yeah, when Stephanie was talking about this idea, it brought back the idea there's no I in team. Okay, and so that is taught. It's a leadership model. Right. Yeah. And it's not a bad thing to say under a certain circumstance. In other words, hey, we're in this together. And it's that kind of motivational thing is that yeah, we're pulling together to do this. And this boat isn't going to get to the other shore unless we work in harmony. Yeah. However, <laughs> the coxswain gets to say, or whatever, th there are individuals in the team. And so they are, there are eyes in team. It's just not in the word, but it, there is an eye. And mm -hmm. that eye, and for the it depends on the purpose we're talking about. And right. This is we're talking about here. This is about having a reasonable conversation about your own performance mm -hmm. to help supervisors or others or potential employer understand the value you bring. And, but people have trouble. It's obvious, I think, from this uh, topic and how we're talking about it. Some people really have the trouble and breaking away from the notion that it was just a team effort. And I was just part of it. So anyway. Yeah, it's, it's an interesting challenge. 
Anybody else have comments or questions? I appreciate all the engagement. I know we're getting ready to wind up. I know one of you said you were excited for the conversation. I hope it met your needs, at least to air it out and give you some ideas. And as always, you'll have the recording link and the references. Anyone else before we close? I appreciate everybody. Appreciate your interest. Thanks for those that put in the chat that they seem to get a lot out of it. We're meeting in two weeks from now, and we're talking about references and what should you do and who should you ask and how do you get the references on time, all those good things. And Ron, if you'll close the meeting, please. Yeah, thanks very much, everyone, for, for joining us today. Interesting topic, and it's an important topic. So thanks, Sue, for, for putting it together. I appreciate it. I learn some stuff. I like it when I do that. So thank you. And thank you for everyone for contributing. See you in a couple of weeks.